Good morning. Welcome to the Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Free Press Media Press Inc. and Alternative Parties Books Publisher sponsors this podcast. I'm Andrew Bouchard. Welcome to Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Today, Alternative Parties friends, we have some more exciting guests like we usually do. This time, we have a couple of gentlemen who represent an organization called Utah Approved, and they also are involved in alternative parties. And we like to see that connection because we here support election reform and alternative parties, so the two coming together is extra excellent. So welcome to the podcast, Utah Approves. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. We're glad to have you, gentlemen. So kindly get us started by you giving us an introduction to yourself, a brief biographical sketch. Sure. Um, Yeah, so I'll start. Uh, My name is Nate Allen. Uh, I'm the executive director of Utah Approve. Uh, I founded Utah Approves back in 2020 um, after getting politically involved the year prior. Um, I actually volunteered on Andrew Yang's 2020 campaign um, and was just a volunteer. And after he dropped out, I got pretty fired up about trying to bring those policies to the local level um, as that is the most effective way to change things uh, in the country. And so um, I started to look at what policies could make a big difference and found voting methods. Eventually found my way to approval voting, which uh, I'm sure we'll talk about more later, uh, and then started the organization. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much a, a quick bio of uh, what's relevant, at least, and how, what got me into the organization. Sure. Yeah, so I can go next. Uh, my name is Ammon Crewell. Um, some, somewhat similar story to, to Nate. I first got involved in, with politics uh in 2016, helping out Evan McMullen's independent presidential campaign. I just worked to advocate for uh, good ideals, protecting democracy, protecting free speech, um, and then that led me into uh, election reform. I actually ran for the Utah legislature in 2020 and and really pushed for election reform in my campaign. And then shortly thereafter, almost two years ago now, I I met Nate and got involved with Utah Proves, and now I'm the Vice President and Director of Advocacy of, of Utah Proves. Excellent. So since you were involved in a prior campaign, kindly describe how that campaign, what it taught you and how you're using that today. Nate, do you want to go first? Oh, sure, yeah. Um, So uh, if you're referencing like the Yang campaign, um, yeah, so my involvement wasn't super deep. I wasn't like an employed staff or anything. I kind of just volunteered to do phone banking, text banking. Um, I ended up going out to Iowa and knocking doors. So um, just a lot of like basic volunteer experience, but that helped me get a taste for what this kind of work is like. Um, and one thing that was really cool for me to experience was even though you're kind of doing, um, you know, frontline work, getting out knocking doors for, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, uh, something about that was still really exciting for me. Um, unlike most jobs that I've worked, because it was something that I was passionate about, I didn't get sure. worn out as quickly. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I would still be able to, you know, reflect and, and think positively about how much time I just spent. So, um, yeah, that was something that really motivated me to get into this work, was actually having something to work on that I cared about. Makes sense. Yeah, in my experience, I've, I've cared a lot about a lot of these issues for so long. And if you're just posting on social media or talking to friends, it just feels like you're screaming into the void and not making any difference. And the powerful thing about a campaign is that you're getting together with other passionate people, and together you can make a much bigger difference than any one person on your own. And so um, being part of a campaign and out there talking to people, you know, phone banking, um, marching in the streets, whatever you're doing – uh, you represent a larger idea and not just yourself, and so you can make a much bigger difference together. Sure. So kindly tell us the mission of Utah Approves. Yeah, so the mission of Utah Approves is to bring more representative and fairer elections to Utah using well-researched and common-sense policies. All right. And you you support approval voting, right? That's right, yeah. So kindly describe that to our audience. A lot of our audience is well-informed on election reform, so they're probably familiar. They probably at least heard of it. In case someone hasn't or there's new people to this space, kindly describe what approval voting is. Sure. 
Yeah, approval voting is a really simple method that allows voters to choose multiple people on their ballot rather than just choosing one. Um, votes are still tallied up as normal, and the person with the most votes wins. So what this does is it guarantees that the person who wins the election is actually the most liked across the population and didn't have to win through strategy or, um, you know, a candidate splitting votes in another part of the election. Um, it actually allows for all candidates to have their true support shown at the end of the day. Sure. So what would you say are arguments for approval voting? All right, Herman, I mean, you want to take this one? Yeah, sure. So uh, first of all, let me just say that when you have a two-person race, just two people running against each other, it really doesn't matter what type of voting method you use. The, the type of voting method really only matters when you have three, four, five, six, whatever number of people running because it just gets a lot more complicated. The dynamics change considerably. Um, if you have two people in a race, you know, Republican, Democrat, but then a third person jumps in the race that polls mainly from the Republican, then it throws the election to the Democrat. So it's, it's almost like a jumping into a race. You hurt the people that you are most like. Um, you hurt the people that you would actually be happiest with winning. And so voting reform really seeks to, to accomplish that. And uh, one thing that we want to do as we do these reforms is we want to improve the system, but we want to change as little as possible. We want to keep it as simple as possible. So approval, approval voting accomplishes that. It really only changes one small little rule on your ballot, just allowing you to vote for more than one instead of just one. But every other aspect of the voting system is the same. Um, it's tabulated the same. The winner is determined the same. The auditing process is the same. Um, there's no extra expense, uh, no new voting machines, no new voting software. Um, but it allows, it essentially eliminates the spoiler effect. Like in my example before, if you have a Republican Democrat running and, you know, a conservative jumps in the race as a third party, uh, you know, people on the right can just vote for both if they like, and it's not going to split that vote on the right. So I've heard of this before. We had another guest talk about approval voting. So just, can you clarify for our audience? You can vote for as many people as you want. I've heard them say, is that how you see it? You can vote for, if there's 10 people, you can vote for eight of them. If you like eight, if there's only three you like, you can vote for three. Is that a way to sum it up? Yeah, exactly. I mean, some people will still only vote for one, and that's totally fine. I mean, I mean, that's. I mean, even if everyone did that, that's still no worse than our current system. Yeah, you can vote for two, three, four. I mean, some people will vote for the people that they like. Other people maybe really hate a candidate and will vote for everybody else. I mean, you can kind of decide how many you want to vote for. You just kind of set your approval threshold and then vote for everybody above that threshold. All right. So what arguments have people put forth to you to argue against this, and how have you countered those arguments? Um, sorry, I am at an airport right now. Can you guys hear this announcement in the background? Okay, so you want me to repeat the question? Uh, I just don't want to jump in if, if that's going to mess up the audio. Um, I don't know why they're talking for so long. I can, I can answer it. Okay, thanks, Do you want to ask it again? Sure. So what arguments have people put against approval voting, and how would you counter those arguments? Yeah, so there's a couple main things that come up over and over. The first thing that I hear just from people that are relatively uninformed is the idea that approval voting violates the one person, one vote principle. Um, and you see this one person and you get more than one vote in the election. But most people don't understand that that principle doesn't actually apply to this scenario. What that one person, one vote means, it dates back to the 1960s or so when the Supreme Court established the idea that different districts within a state, for example, have the same number of voters within them. And so every voter has equal voting power, equal voting influence. It has nothing to do with being able to, you know, support more than one candidate in a race. And so there's just that common misconception that uh, we seek to dispel frequently. Another sure. common thing that we see from actually people in the voting reform community uh, that might support other alternative methods like ranked choice voting is they want to be able to specify that they like one candidate more than another candidate. And that's totally fine. Um, I, I would really like to be able to do that too. 
Uh, but it's really just trying to find a balance between the simplicity of the voting method and, you know, I guess, the expressiveness of the voting method. Yes, with approval voting, you can't, you know, support one over another, but at least you can support more than one, and that's going to be much better than our current system. And overall, it averages out so that, you know, maybe I like two candidates and, and support both of them, and the next person likes two candidates but one a lot more than the other, so they only support the one. And it really averages out to the most liked candidate getting the most votes. And so while individual voters can't be quite as expressive, the overall voting populace can be much more expressive, and you end up with the best winner winning. Sure. Makes sense. So kindly tell us how your organization promotes your views. How, how are you spreading the word? What what are you doing to advance your mission? Yeah, so uh, we have a lot of different paths that we're trying to pursue right now. Um, some of those are on the lobbying side of things, talking to legislators, city council members, the county clerks. Um, notably, we've actually received the support of all 29 county clerks in the state um, for approval voting as the best alternative method. Uh, so that, that's been a really uh, huge ally for us. Um, we've also been working on uh, just setting up tabling events across the state, getting out and actually talking to people about these things, um, trying to spread awareness. We're also um, currently working on a social media advertising campaign. Um, so we're, we're trying to get the word out basically in any way we can. Sure. So when you're getting the word out, what do you think is the best strategy? You mentioned talking to county clerks. So do you think it's good to do it at the county or city level, or do you think it's something we can do nationally? How do you see the path to implementation of approval voting? Yeah, well, um, we, of course, would like to see it nationally, uh, but the, the theory of change in the U.S. is um, really focused on a bottom-up approach. So you, if you pass things on a local scale first and then move to a statewide scale, it builds confidence across the country. And then when you reach a certain threshold, then something is actually viable to be passed nationally. Um, so that's our strategy right now is trying to start local. Um, but that being said, there's uh, there's two possible routes that we're looking at in Utah. Um, there is a current pilot project right now that would allow us to um, have cities test out approval voting. And if they like it, they can, uh, they can continue to use it. Um, so we're trying that route is right now. But we're also trying to talk to state legislators, legislatures about um, passing it statewide as well, if that is a viable option. There's actually a large discussion going on in Utah right now about solving the issue that plurality voting brings, and so we're trying to show that approval voting um, ex actually is the best option and get that uh, instituted statewide. It sounds like Utah is receptive to this idea. Yeah, uh, we've re received uh, mixed responses so far, so some legislators are, are pretty receptive to it, some don't like it as much. Um, there are some allies for ranked choice voting in the state, so there's a healthy debate going on between those two methods. Um, but one thing that we found really nice about Utah is that while you know typically we're considered a very conservative state, there actually is a progressive history in Utah of, of people who want to uh, implement effective changes, even if they may be new. Um, a good example of this is Utah was one of the first states to implement mail-in voting uh, and actually does it very, very well. And, and people across the state really like mail-in voting, whether you're conservative or are on the left. Um, so that's something that we found to be a, a positive environment for change here in Utah. That's good. I didn't know that, so that's interesting to find out. So as we mentioned in the start of the podcast, that you're you got your gentlemen are involved in alternative parties and or political campaigns and also involved in this organization. So in each of those positions, it has different responsibilities, different different roles that you play. In one, you have to be a certain way. In another, you have to be a certain way. So how do you take your hats off so that you're effectively doing your role in the one organization versus the other one? And we do have people in our audience that we've interviewed before who do similar things. So what, how would you describe that and how could people do that the best? Yeah, I mean, you want to start with one? Yeah, for sure. Um, so like I mentioned before, I, I was a candidate for the Utah 
a state legislature in 2020, and I'm actually running again uh, here in 2022. Um, and I'm also the Davis County chair of the party here in Utah. So I'm a member of the, the United Utah Party. It's a, a moderate, uh, kind of centrist, reform-focused party. Um, and, yeah, like you said, it, you do have to wear two different hats. So Utah Approves is strictly nonpartisan. Um, everything we advocate for is just improving the, the voting system for all parties, right? Um, and then as a, a member of the, the Utah, you know, as Utah Party, I'm also advocating for m many of these same reforms because we see it as one of the best reforms, one of the best ways to improve our system. So, I mean, while I have to be partisan in one case and, and nonpartisan in another, um, generally, I, I think um, most people can agree that the, these aren't partisan reforms that we're focusing on. Um, they would benefit everybody just because I think we can all agree that we want to improve representation. And so um, the two roles work really well together. Sounds like there's overlap. And Nate, how would you describe it? Yeah, so um, I work with the Ford Party, which is a new third party started by Andrew Yang. Um, and recently they've actually merged with the Renew America Movement and the Serve America Movement. Um, working with this uh, so far has actually been really interesting. So I'm the Utah State lead, and uh, my experience with that position so far is pretty similar to what it's like to be an executive director of a nonprofit. Um, you're, you're building a team. You're, you're trying to get people set up to be self-sufficient and um, fulfill their roles where um, you can just check in and make sure things are running okay. So that part has been really similar. Um, but kind of as Ammon mentioned, there is that uh, air of partisanship once you start working with a party that um, is, is definitely not helpful when you're working in a, on a nonpartisan nonprofit. Um, and so the way that I like to try to keep these hats separate, kind of like Ammon said, is um, these policies are very nonpartisan. And so we try to support those through the forward party as well. And that's what I mainly try to focus on. Um, and that way we can say, you know, even though we're with the forward party, we're not trying to advance partisan aims. I'm not even trying to work on getting specific candidates elected right now. We're just trying to reform the system to uh, actually be a better environment for future third parties and even independent candidates to win elections. Sounds good. So how can our audience support Utah Approves? Yeah, well, the best way that you can support Utah Approves is donating. You can go to our website, and we have a donate button right there on the home page. Um, that is immensely helpful as it helps us uh, buy materials to go do more voter awareness efforts across the state. Um, it also helps us uh, get things done like polling, um, and eventually if we want to uh, start pushing um, further legislation that helps us with uh, legal research and drafting. Um, so donating is definitely the biggest thing you can do to help. Um, but if any of your listeners are here uh, in Utah, that's really, really helpful. Um, if you want to just go sign up to volunteer, we need people to help get, like, spread the word and, and get out and do these tabling events across the state. Um, we're doing pretty well in a lot of the major counties, um, but more help is always useful, and we definitely like to spread more out into the rural areas as well. All right. That sounds excellent. Yeah, and I would just add to that that, I mean, approval voting is something that would make sense for anywhere in the country. And so if you're passionate about it, wherever you are, you know, start posting on, on uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever and, and find a community where you are and, and, and try to build awareness of approval voting in your own area. I, I think it will help the whole country. Yes, it would. All right, Nate and Ammon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We appreciate you talking about your organization and the reforms that you are striving to implement. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks again for having us. This was great. Yeah, thank you. All the best to you and your organization. Take care. Thanks. Have a good one.